talking about probably Hedra. Hi, yeah, so we'll talk about probability, and you guys have probably seen how, you guys have probably seen how probability <laughs> simplices can be used to uh, parameterize the space of distributions, especially over a finite set. So today, um, well, let me just illustrate over here. So, for example, if you have three possibilities, like snow, rain, and sunny, then uh, if you want to represent that it'll always, that with 100% chance it'll be snowing, then you would put a point here. If it's a 33-33-33% uh, 33, 33, chance, it'd be like here. And if there's a half-half chance of snow and rain, you'd have a point here. So basically, any point in this uh, filled-in triangle represents the distribution over these three possibilities, right? So simplices are very nice. And we'll consider a category whose objects contain the simplices, but we'll see that if we add not only all the simplices, but all the convex algebras, or convex sets as I'll call them, uh, that gives us a bit more elbow room to model things like independence, uh, and uh, sufficient statistics, complete statistics, and so forth. So, um, so we'll proceed in four steps. First, I'll introduce you to this category we'll, we'll work in. Um, I'll call it con. And we saw before, like I think two weeks ago, with Brendan, that con is just the island Greg Moore category over the monad dist, but we don't have to think about it that way. But if you'd like to, you can. Um, and then after that, we'll show that's a very nice category. We'll show that has all limits and coefficients, uh, has an internal hom and a tensor adjunct to that. And using these ideas, we can express a notion of independence and a notion of Bayes' theorem. Or we'll, we'll, just, we'll just sort of do it by definition. So um, we'll just force Bayes' theorem to be true. Um, then after that, I'll sketch sort of how to think about Bayesian inference of various graphs in terms of string diagrams. This is the sketchiest thing that I'll show you, which is why it's not a thing at the end. And then after that, we'll actually prove some things, uh, which from this perspective are trivial. So we'll prove the fischer neumann factorization theorem, which Alex and I saw today in class. Uh, we'll prove Basu's theorem and Bahadur's theorem. And you've probably seen these, I mean, they're probably by other names since they've probably been rediscovered a lot. But these are basic theorems about sufficient statistics. Um, any questions so far? No? Okay, so let's begin by defining our category. So, so we have our category con with convex algebras, and uh, the objects are just convex sets. So I'll define, there are many ways to define it, but I'll just say very concretely that it's a set S equipped with a mixing operator mu from 0, 1 times S squared to S that satisfies uh, that, so we think of this as, we think of like, uh, I'll say, uh, C x y as going to C x plus 1 minus C y, okay? So in some sense, uh, this returns a convex combination of x and y. Um, what does this have to satisfy? Well, all we require, and this is just what falls out of the eilenberg moore construction, is that uh, mu of 0 x y equals x, uh, oh, sorry, uh, uh, I guess of 1 and then mu of 0 x y equals uh, y, and furthermore, I won't write this out because it's messy, but that it's distributive in the right way. So that if you have, so intuit, I'll just draw it out like here. <coughs> So if, for example, if you want to get a combination like this, first you can get a combination between two points like this, and then after that you can combine this with this in whatever ratio is needed. Okay, so it's distributed. Um, so this is just the... Need associative or distributive? What? Did you need associative or distributive? Um, I don't quite know what I mean. I, well, let, me, let, me just, let me just write it out. And then, we, and then let's discuss. Okay, so um, first of all, oh, oh no, is it already timed for, oh, it's time for my talk. Okay, um, <laughs> great. So, um, so in order to write it out, and that's a great question, I don't really know what to call it. Uh, let me just generalize this by using sort of finite sum notation. So all I mean is that, so if you have ci of uh, dji, uh, X. So here, these are real numbers, and uh, and I'll have x, j, i, and these are in S. This should be the same as sum over i, j, c, i, d, j, i, x. Um, so I'll just okay, yeah. So so these are in R, and these are in S. 
Does that make sense? So it's like distributivity, but um, I guess the fact that we're generalizing to finitary combinations, not just combinations of one and two, uh, means that there's also some associativity involved. If you want to prove this, for example, for real, for subsets of, of real vector spaces. Does that answer your question? Um, just to make sure these are the morphisms or these are the objects? These are the objects, okay. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay, great. Um, but what are the morphisms? Well, the morphisms are just what you'd expect, I mean, and they also fall out of this construction. The morphisms are just set maps that preserve the mixing operator. Is that a cow joke? Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, this is a cow category. Um, so so all, all we want is that, like, f of, well, okay, I'll just write it out formally, but it's just the thing that you would expect. So, morphs, can everyone see this? No, okay. Um, I'll just write it here. So we have f that's s value parameterized by t such that, well, what do we want? We want f of uh, mu c of uh, t, t prime uh, equal to uh, mu c of f of t, f of t prime. Okay? Notice, by the way, when I said, this is a separate comment, but notice when I said finitary co uh, combination, I meant one or more. We don't want a zero area or null area combination because these are, in so, like, like, a good example of these are the affine spaces, affine real spaces. These don't have a zero, right? So there's no notion of, like, um, the, well, okay, you see what I'm saying. Yeah, okay, great. Any questions about this category? I'll give you two examples of nice objects in this, or interesting objects. You guys look confused already. This is not hard. <laughs> Good? Okay, cool. So, so examples. I'll give you some examples of objects and morphisms. Well, first of all, uh, we have our friendly simplices. So for example, we have a zero simplex, which is empty. We have a one simplex. Uh, I'll just uh, index them by the number of points they have, the number of vertices. One simplex, we have, for example, a three simplex that looks like this, and you can should imagine as solid. And we have a two simplex, we have other simplices. There are also some non-simplices. For example, there's a square. And what we'll see later is that this parameterizes the space of independent distributions over coin flips, because there are two canonical projections to, well, if you build the square the right way, then it comes equipped with a canonical projection down, and also uh, to the side, to two of these to two, two simplices, and a two simplex, of course, just parameterizes the space of weights on a coin, right? So this, so we'll later see how non-simplices can encode independent assumptions. But first let me just show you how the morphisms work, too. So uh, what does the morphism, for example, from the point to the triangle look like? Well, it just chooses an element, right? So the point is terminal, so we can just call this an element, and it works very much like in the category of sets. Um, in fact, we'll see there's an adjunction, blah, 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 but I'll be for in a bit. Um, so, it just looks like this. And again, uh, any map here just specifies, just specifies a distribution. So, this illustrates our general idea that instead of thinking of these objects as distributions, we should think of the maps as distributions. In fact, what's a map from a non-point, for example, from a triangle to a simplex? Well, that just parameterizes a conditional distribution. For example, um, here, let me draw this a bit bigger. So, we have an interval like this. And suppose we just have a map that, so the simplex is free, uh, it turns out. Um, and of course, because every point here is a combination of the three vertices, we can specify a map just by specifying where the three vertices go, and there are no relations because it's free, obviously, uh, if one thinks about it. Um, everything is obvious if one thinks about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is, so I'm sort of drawing the image here, but do you see what we're doing is we're just projecting it down here. This is, of course, not the only map, but this is the map that is interesting to think about just for illustrations. Um, what this means is, uh, well, again, I'm not sure whether it helps to have a concrete example, but suppose this is, uh, suppose this is snow, rain, and uh, sunny, and suppose this is, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, scarf and not scarf. I was going to wear my scarf today, but I lost it. So, um, so then what this would so what we have then is a conditional distribution that, and we can write this as probability of a given b, where b is one of these three events and a is one of these two events. Does that make sense? 
So the data of this morphism precisely contains the data of this conditional distribution. When, when you said it's interesting when we are looking at the projection down, there's nothing about it being those like straight lines that makes it fit, right? You can draw lines from any yeah. vertex to any point on there. That's right, yeah. And is yeah. there a probability interpretation of uh, what this morphism does to a point inside of the simplex? Yeah. An expectation? It, yep. Uh, well, we'll get, that's great. Yeah, we'll get to expectations in a bit. Uh, what's nice, well, okay, well, yeah, okay, that's a great question. So, suppose now that we have, uh, that we know something about the weather. So, so this is just a conditional distribution, or if you'd really like, we don't even have to imagine that this is distribution over these, so we can write it like this. This is the notation for if the B doesn't, is like this external non-probabilistic variable. But just for simplicity, I'll just always use this notation, even when it's not conventional. Um, but suppose we do have a prior over this. So what this, what we can talk of this as prior, uh, probably of B given true, or just probably of B, okay? And this tells us, this gives us a prior over the weather, and if you compose these two maps just under this construction, and the composition is just composition of set maps, then what you get is, well, in this case, you get, the reason I drew as a projection is not because it's especially uh, important, I guess, but it's, in, it's nice to draw so that you get this point. So this point is the probability of a scarf uh, versus a not scarf, just given this prior over weather. Does that make sense? Um, <clears throat> so in other words, uh, okay, I'll just go straight through, and I'm writing bigger than I expected, so I'll have to erase a lot, but oh well. So in other words, a function composition automatically implements what this, this property that we have for Markov chains, uh, namely that this equals... Uh, Does that make sense? That's very nice. Now, Alex asked about expectations. And so one nice thing about generalizing from simplices to convex sets in general is that R is also a convex set. So, for example, okay, I'll erase this. Suppose that we just map this into R and have, uh, so R looks like this. Um, oh, sorry, thanks. And, and suppose um, I, I didn't spend, I sort of thought abstractly while thinking about this talk, but uh, now I realize I should probably have an example. Um, so let, let's just say like itchiness or something. <laughs> so let's say that if I wear a scarf, the itchiness is 7, and if I wear a not scarf, the itchiness is 2. Um, let's say minus 2, just to be comfortable. <laughs> and, and then what you get is that function composition gives you the expected value. And so, in other words, function composition automatically implements that expectation of um, how should I say this? f of uh, a given c is uh, the sum over all, um, okay, this is r and r of the probability that uh, f of a equals r given a times probability of a given c. This is perhaps a clunky way of writing it, but it really shows how this is analogous to this, right? Does that make sense? Uh, is there a mistake? I don't think there's a mistake. Yeah. Okay, great. Great, so we have this. Now, you notice that all of the sets that we've talked about, uh, simplices, uh, squares, R, are subsets, are convex subsets of a real vector space, right? But it turns out that there's some exotic convex sets, too, and uh, the theory that will develop, to the extent that will develop any theory at all, which is not a very true sense, but um, will apply to them, but I still haven't figured out how to interpret them well. So this is an interesting uh, thing to just think about, perhaps, during query and cookie time. So uh, here's an example of an exotic algebra. So let's start with our familiar interval, OK? But now let's just take a quotient. And by quotient, I just mean, uh, like, just work in set, for example. For, and then, OK, well, here, here's what it is. So uh, let's label this with 0, 1. And the idea is that we identify the whole interior, OK? So what it looks like intuitively is this blob, like sort of a generic interior point, which is a single point, okay? So we identify, so it's a set of three things, and I will uh, suggestively call them yes, maybe, and no, okay? So we have a set map here, and using the set map, we can just let this inherit the mixing operator from this, okay? The thing to do is to check it's well-defined, and it turns out it is well-defined. And so we here have this weird... Uh, exotic convex set, which has three points, but they're all different, 
and, and to the extent that this is a probability simplex, I like to think of this as a possibility simplex. Is something necessary, necessarily not, or either? Okay. So um, one thing that I haven't thought about is how to translate stuff about sufficient statistics and ancillary statistics, completeness of statistics, Bayes theorems, into this sort of more discrete logic. So I don't know. I thought that was really cool. So just keep in mind, this, this is a nice counterexample to certain things. For example, uh, this makes it clear that uh, not every retract, sorry, that not every epi is a retract, and a few other things. But, um, but yeah. OK. I think I'm, I'm something. What is, uh, what is like 0.5 yes plus 0.5 no? Yeah, it is maybe. Yeah. Point so two yes plus point maybe. maybe. No is also <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, so and you, you're mapping maybe. the entire interior of that thing of one of the one zero simplex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so notice that in this axiomatization, uh, we don't allow ourselves to cancel, right? So if it's if we did allow ourselves to cancel, then the fact that like a one thirds two thirds mix and a two thirds one thirds mix coincide would allow us to you know solve this. Uh, full rank matrix and see that like maybe it actually has to contain two points, but we don't allow ourselves to cancel. We just sort of have this forward direction, right? In other words, we don't we don't uh, say that say that the image of an interval that parameterizes the coefficient has to be injected, right? So in this case, they all collapse. So the mixing rule for this is just everything has to be maybe unless it's forced not to. Like yes plus yes is yes, but okay. Um, any other questions? Yeah, um, I'm just having trouble interpreting the. That second thing, like, uh -huh. are these p's like what you're calling dimorphisms, or is that actually a probability? Or um, okay, so so what I uh, let me let me replace it like this, and so in this case, it would just be one or zero. So I guess what I mean is c um, over a of f of um, Sorry, wait, what am I even doing? Oh my goodness, no. Okay, no, this is F of A. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. I see. It's sum over A, right? Yeah, thank Uh, yeah. This makes sense. Yeah. Um, thanks. Okay, anything else? I mean, okay. So before, but before I said two false things, but they canceled. So, so I mean, this is this is true, and this coincides with function composition. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So let's see how we're doing on time. Excellent. So now let's go on to the next thing. Now that we're familiar with this category, uh, let's talk about <coughs> the colimits and so forth. So cool constructions. Push the other board up first. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Great. So, um, let me just quickly go through what the limits and co-limits and tensor and HAM are, and then we'll actually see them, uh, what they mean uh, very concretely. So, um, to show it has all co uh, to, well, let's start with the limits. So, first let's show it has products, and then we'll show it has equalizers. So, so, oh, sorry. One thing I should do before this, okay, yeah. One thing I should do before this is show you a useful adjunction. So, um, as I alluded to, the simplices are free, and there's a and what I mean by that is is that there's an adjunction. There's an adjunction like this. Okay. So, given a set, what you can do is you can form the simplex whose vertices are that set, right? So I'll just I'll just say um, I'll just say S goes to the S vertex simplex. Okay. Now, with and then and then given given a convex set, you just forget it. Okay. So here's a forgetful functor. Here's a free functor. This is left adjoint to this. Okay. So we have this nice thing. We also have a free functor from conv to vec, and how it works is that C maps to uh, R to the plus C over the relations of like all the affine relations in C. Okay. So this is and it's just. It's a bit less obvious than that, but it's almost equally obvious. It's in like the same order of magnitude. And of course, V just goes to V. So this is another forgetful function. Okay. Now, uh, any questions about this? What so, is R plus C? Sorry? What is R plus C and what is and what is Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, so so let, let, let's let's dive into this particular free functor. So you have free from con to vec. And it sends C to this thing that I'm calling R plus C over this. So what this is is a vector space uh, generated by a basis 
indexed by C. So just take the elements of C as, uh, as formal elements. And you know, this plus is direct sum. So this is just like a C co-product. Is, C is any convex set? C is any convex set, yep. So For example, if you have an exotic convex set. At the, at the continuous Sorry, once at the continuum of all possible convex sets that you're forming a vector space that's not even uh, a Hilbert space because it has a continuous... Yeah, that, well, yeah, that's true. So this is not countable space. dimensional in most cases. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not a Hilbert space, 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 but we don't need any, like, uh, <coughs> inner product. So nowhere here will we use anything but, like, linear mm -hmm. algebra-looking things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. However, when we mod out by this relation, uh, we get something that's usually finite dimensional for the convex that's out here. So this relation is generated by, um, so whenever mu of uh, a, x, y equals z, it's generated by a, x. So I'll, I'll write bar for sort of the formal element in here. So if x is in c, then x bar is in this co-product. So x bar plus 1 minus a, uh, y bar equals z bar. So it's just generated, it's, it's a relation generated by these. So for example, you, so in particular we mod out by the subspace generated by the span of, well, the, that's a span of these. Okay. So this is just, you know, a co-product and this is like a co-equalizer. This is the co, -con the leftist construction which makes some things a free functor. So is that just like the vector space generated by like the lines in the convex set? Is that... Um, I don't. So if, you take a, if you take, oh sorry, but I'm seeing as if you take like three in set, and you go all the way, to, if you go to con, you get this three yeah. simplex. If you yeah. go to vec, you get the vector space containing the three simplex as its diag, like as the things we sum is to one. Yeah. So you get R three. Or yeah, you get R three, and then if you go back, you get the embedding of, of the triangle in that vector. Yeah, yeah. So that's a great example. So, um, so this this triangle would go to R three. This is uh, this is an embedding of a simplex in in real space that people like. So yeah, which is the unit of the. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, if you if you go this way. Yeah. Uh -huh. So is it easy to see what it is on the square? That sort of the interval times the interval. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know. Well, let's think. So uh, it would also be three dimensional. Ah, yes, it would be R three as well. It would be R three as well. Yeah, I mean, one way to see that uh, this is sort of sketchy, but you can think of like, like this construction doesn't really care about anything but sort of just the dimension of this of just something in the interior. Mm -hmm. So for so you can model a square as this, and then just it would embed like this. And uh, the the one difference is that even though it's isomorphic to this, it's not canonically isomorphic to like a standard R three basis, <coughs> a standard R three with a standard basis because like. There are there are no three privileged axes. Does that make sense? But still, are that's a good question. That's pretty cool. Okay, cool. Okay, so this is an injunction, and using this, we can be inspired to guess what the limits and co-limits are. Um, can I erase this? Yeah. Okay. Oh, what does that mean? Oh no. Okay. There's a lot of cool stuff I want to show you. Is this interesting so far? I hope so. Great. Okay. So, um, so limits. Or, oh yeah, so products. Let's show that products exists first. So, uh, the, so we have a forgetful functor which has to preserve limits, right? So that means as a set, every limit will just be a, whatever it is in set, okay? And from this, does that make sense? So from this, we can easily guess uh, what what the construction should be. So in particular, uh, the product will just be as a set, Cartesian product with element wise mixing. So this is element, me, me, it's not elementary to write this, element wise. <laughs> okay. Did you get component wise? Uh, yeah, that's what I mean. Okay. Sorry, yeah. okay. Yeah. Component wise. Cool. Okay, so um, we've already seen the square is uh, actually, I'll make a table uh, after this, so, so I'll draw the square as an example. But let's go quickly to, there's no clock. Let's go quickly to, oh, it's okay, to uh, um, equalizers. Okay, so same idea, so it's just the equalizer in set, 
with mixing inherited from the, so meaning that it will actually be a subset, right? It'll, it turns out it'll be a convex subset, if you think about it. So let me just draw, an, so uh, same, same as this, uh, e.g. Um, well, so, uh, t so, okay, so, okay, so suppose you have, uh, suppose you have a square and it maps to the line two ways, so, uh, um, side, so horizontal and vertical, maps to line two ways, okay, what's, what's the equalizer this diagram? So it'll be the subset of points here, which have the same coordinates here, so the equalizer will be this diagonal, right? Okay, so that's just an example. Okay, so co-product. Now, to, to figure out what this is, we should be inspired by this. And of course, this isn't enough data to actually, so one has to check this, but I won't check it for you. So for co-products, it's just the free finitary combinations, finitary convex combinations. Okay. Um, does this make sense? This is like a thing it has to be, right? So, um, um, should I write this out or is it a quick? Could you give an example for PFC? Oh, great. Yeah. Wait, okay, okay sure. <laughs> uh, so, um, e.g. So, what is, what is, what, what's this uh, co-product this? Any ideas? Like what it looks like? Uh, what? Square. Okay, it, not quite, okay. but it has four points, you're right. It has four, the problem with a square is a square has two times two points, right? But this thing will actually have two plus two points. Yeah. <laughs> so what thing has two plus two points? Prism, yes, a tetrahedron. So, okay, so, and here's how these embed. So this embeds here, and this embeds here, and later we'll contrast this to the tensor product. The tensor of these two uh, also looks like this, but the way these embed is different. Well, so they don't embed, actually, the way they outbed. Yeah. Great. Okay. Can you interpret that as a probability? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is, this is um, probably, uh, I think a good guiding example, first of all, is, uh, let, let me first show you what this with, okay, I'll erase this, but then I'll redraw it, because I don't have space. So what's this? It's just actually let, let's let's make this a pentagon. What's a pentagon plus a dot? Well, that's just a pyramid. That's just a pentagon shaped, a based pyramid, right? So probabilistically, this gives you sort of the code. It gives you a chance to say like like other or I don't know. Does that make sense? Okay. So if you're maybe thinking about probabilistic programming languages, this would just be a sum type. Okay. Is it a coin flip, and then you pick something and you don't want to use two? Yeah, you can think of it that way. Well, uh, yeah, you, you, you can. Yeah, you can think about it that way. And is and the reason I between this and like a six simplex though, or is there? Yeah, for us, a six simplex is not three dimensional. Right. But yeah, co -product, what? But co product preserve the simplicities. Is that? Yeah, so co-product, uh, yeah, but this pentagon is not a simplex. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but that's right. So uh, n simplex plus an m simplex is an n plus m simplex. Right. Uh -huh. So it's the limiting things, which have to do with independence, we'll see, that move you out of simplex land. So is it is a morphism from 1 to uh -huh. that? Like, that, that, like that, that's, the same data as, that's the same data as giving distribution over whatever this represents, or question mark. Well, it, what do you mean? It's like a mutation over this or question mark. What I mean is, it's the same as saying it's a, it's the same as uh, flip a coin, yeah. and then you decide if, if it's in one of them, you go to you go to the first one, and if you, it's in the other one, you go to the second one, and you pick a. That's the that's the generative model that actually over parameterizes it a little bit because like what if like what if you're at this dot, then you don't care what this thing is, right? But um, that's a good question, and I don't know how to communicate the answer, so can we talk about it after? Yeah, okay. Okay, so we have co-products. Well, let's, let's spend 20 seconds thinking about how to.
if I pick out a, a point on one of those like lines that's going up halfway between the two originals. Yeah, oh, how about, like, it's a lot like the maybe monad in Haskell, right? It's like, in, in this particular case, we're plusing oh, with sure. one yeah. thing, right? So it's just saying, like, I can return none, or I don't know, or error, or this. So a probabilistic program which has it, which returns a type in this, is like a probabilistic program which returns this uh, thing in this pentagon, but it, there's a possibility of error. Is that okay? I know you work in probabilistic programs, so that's why I'm using this again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, but is, the, is there a probability that, is there like a probability of doing one or the other, which is like how far yeah, on that Yeah, 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 there, there is, which is... And then you project right, down yeah. to get like the distribution if you chose the coin and, or, yeah. Yeah, in fact, in fact, let, let's, let's see that uh, very concretely. So whenever we have A uh, with B, okay, well, there's a terminal element, which, okay, I never actually said this uh, or proved this, but it, I think it's clear that there's a terminal element which is just a point, right? And because of that, we have a map from A to 1 and a map from B to 1. Uh, by 1, I just mean the 1 simplex, that is the point. And so we have a map to this, right? And this is just our familiar 2, right? 1 plus 1 equals 2. Um, that's Russell's theorem. And, uh, and, so this, and so this projection gives you the probability that's A or B, right? So this is David's coin flip. Is that yep. okay? Yep. Okay, great. So uh, finally, co-equalizers, uh, yeah. I'll erase this for reasons you'll see. I mean, just because I don't want to, yeah. Okay, so code equalizers, these are the most mysterious, but they do exist. Okay, so, well, I mean, they exist by abstract nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and why is that? Well, if you have F, G, oh, I just realized I'm not consistent with my arrows. Sometimes they go right, sometimes they go left, but oh well. <sighs> so, uh, so C stands for a co-equalizer. So we have A, B, and C. And what is this? Well, uh, what we can do is we can just say C is defined to be, uh, well, first, as a set, what it's defined to be uh, mod B mod this, right? Uh, where, but the question is, what should this relation be? Now, probably to half of you, this is obvious, but uh, I think it's nice to say it a little bit more explicitly. Well, so first of all, we want this to be an affine relation. And by that, I mean, so. By that I mean if A uh, if A is the same as uh, B and C is the same as D, then we want any mixture. So uh, so mu um, uh, <coughs> mu uh, what's another number E. Okay, this is bad. Um, uh, I'll just say mu uh, zero point six for a generic thing of A C equals mu zero point six of B D, right? So we say that relation is affine if it's like this, and this is exactly what you need for for B to in, sorry for C to inherit B's mixing structure, right? And then the thing to check is that an intersection of affine relations is affine, and thus there exists a minimal affine relation, and thus there exists an initial element, right? So that's how you show that works. Okay, this is mentioned. Now the reason I say this is mysterious is. Just as products move us out of simplex land, co-equalizers can move us out of probability land into possibility land, because, for example, like we form this using a quotient operation, this is a co-equalizer of some form. So uh, the rest of this talk won't use these, but it's nice to know that co-limits exist. Uh, we'll use co-products, though. OK? OK? Yeah. Okay. So uh, now I'll erase this. Now let's do some examples. Like, uh, And I already showed you some, but, um, but OK. So uh, what do you think? This, and I already did this, but let me just do this again so that I can do it more colorfully. Uh, what, what, what's the product of these? A square. A square, that's right, yeah. So, it's a square, <laughs> and, but it's, it's a square with some structure, right? So there are two projection maps that, that look like this, right? Oh, I should have flipped the colors, but oh well. Okay, so, um, how about a co-product? Oh, oh I, wait, we already did all of these. Okay, yeah, but that, that's okay. They're, they're, okay, so we know this to be a tetrahedron, and I'll just draw it again. Um, and it looks different. Now, how about tensor? So, uh, okay, so first, I haven't actually written anything about tensor and HOM, but it's intuitive that HOM 
that we have an internal Tom, right? Because by like element-wise slash component-wise mixing, the hum set is a context set. Okay, so do do have an idea of what hum is? So I'll just write hum of So what is this? This is the this is the space of coin parameterized coins. Right? So how many dimensions do you oh so first of all, what's what's this hum? Just a point to this. A line? Yeah. Yeah, it's a line, right? It's like this. Now what's uh now okay, so what's this? So to specify a map from here to here, since this is free, you just have to specify a map from here to here and a map from here to here, right? So what's the you co product? Uh, almost, it's the other one. The product. Yeah, exactly. It's a product. Now, so it looks like a square like this, uh, but we see it's sort of different because if this is purple, then both of these axes are purple, right? So, so, um, does, does that make sense? So intuitively, this is a cube, while this is a prism. So, for example, if we have this, then it looks like that. But the generalization of this uh, is, is this. Uh, does that make sense? Okay. So, this, uh, so it just happens that it's a low-dimensional coincidence. Okay, great. So finally, how about tensor? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll erase this bottom part of the cube so that we have space for tensor. So what do you think this... Uh, tensor this is. So by tensor I just mean the thing that's adjoint to hum and it turns out it exists. So using your vector space intuition, do you have an idea what tensor is? And while you're thinking, I'll just drop this again better. Okay. So first of all, how many dimensions should it be? Um, let's just heuristically think about this. So, so when you, when you let's, let's, let's move to vector space land, right? So, um, in, the, in the sense that tensor is sort of leftish or free, so we can move to vector space land via this free functor and hope that things work. So, uh, so recall, this, this, since this is a two simplex, it moves to R2, right? And since this is a two simplex, it moves to R2. So what's R2 tensor R2? How many dimensions is that? Four. 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 four, right. Two times, exactly. Good. Good. Yeah. Um, so this is four dimensions, but note, note how this, as a, this, like, in convex land, looks like it's one dimensional. So, and in fact, you sort of see from, uh, from the thing I erased, you see from the thing I erased about how a triangle goes to R3, that there's, uh, there's all of this off by one, and this is related to the off by one of how, like, you know, um, how normalization is a thing in probability, right? So there's always one less degree of freedom than you think there is. So, so this should correspond to something that's four minus one dimensional, right? And yeah. it turns out that corresponds to a tetrahedron, but just like this is a prism, but it, and this is a cube, this is sort of a different type of tetrahedron in, in this sense. If this is purple and this is yellow, then the way that this goes is that you have a purple and a purple and a yellow and a yellow, okay? So that's so what this. So yeah. is it not the case that tensor preserves like three simplices? Um, no, tensor does. It does. Oh. Yeah. But the you know the maps that you that this is equipped with are different. Yeah. That's so a good the question. Of these two functors in the middle. Um, the adjoints between cond and vec. Um. I think so. Yeah. Um, a lot of I mean certainly that's true in the simplices. That's a great question. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we will use the monoidal structure in conv, but after this point I stopped thinking about that, I just, so that's a good question to explore. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so uh, I'll give two more examples of this, uh, time permitting. Oh, great, okay. So, and then after that I'll skip part two and go, oh, well after this will be the joke, and then I'll skip part two mm -hmm. and go to part three, okay? But, okay, so the two more, because I think this is really fun. I think, like, this is something that Euclid could have thought about. So, uh, so the question for you is, um, what's hum of, uh, let's say, this goes to this? So this is, I think Euclid would have enjoyed this, and that's your clue. So, so the point is that we have two independent coin flips that are the condition for this one thing, 
So how many dimensions do you think it is? Well, what? Three? Yeah, three. Exactly. So you'll have some three-dimensional solid. PFC guesses an octahedron? Wow, very good. Yeah, indeed. We have an octahedron right here, and this is what it looks like. Um, wow, wait, how did you come at that? How did you come to that conclusion so quickly? Is it because I showed you? No, because no. Oh, great. Okay, well, very good. Uh, so, what I've shown you, and let's just ponder this for a bit, I think it's really cool. This shows us the geometry of this, um, of this uh, non-trivial setting where we have A independent from B, and these generate C, right? So this, is, this starts to get into like, graphical models, um, and this is the space of all possible such graphical models without a prior on A and B. Of course, if you have a prior on A and B, that's just this times a square, right? So um, I've drawn out, so, what these, so this vertex is everything goes to zero, that vertex is everything goes to one, and so forth. Okay, does that make sense? So it's, it's cool. Um, you can get every polyhedron this way just because every polyhedron is a uh, quotient of a simplex, but yeah. Wait, when you said times, so I'm thinking of like palm of something parameterized by something as like putting a prime, like... Uh, putting... Or, a prior. Oh, well, you're putting a prior on this, that depends on this. Yeah. So this is like, sort of, in some sense, four different priors, <laughs> except that they're related because the prior, well, it's more like lightning this because this is such an essential yes. object in the construction. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Great. Um, one other thing uh, is this. So, so how can we, okay, so we've established that all the all co-limits and, co and limits exist. How can we actually use them? So I'll show you how to interpret um, uh, well, okay, you'll see. I'll show you how to interpret a pullback. So, um, so, and, and this will be the last sort of polyhedral geometry thing before we move on. So, suppose that we have uh, something like this. So, I want to get this right. Let's see. Um, so, suppose we have this projection, and it looks like this. So, the projection goes this way, and this other projection goes this way. Um, and let's be kind to ourselves and, and get these to be the same point so, uh, so that it is easier to draw. Okay, sorry, does that, does that make sense? Okay, I should have, I should have also pre-prepared this drawing. Um, so we have two projections, and uh, so you can think of it as, for example, two experts. Uh, one expert, and so, okay, so, so there's this real state of the world, scarf or not scarf. And the two experts, one of them uh, can see whether there's a scarf or uh, commands that there be a scarf or not, or that there uh, not be a scarf, that there not be a scarf. Or maybe sometimes they are just undecided and just do a coin flip. Likewise with this, but, you know, like they fight it out and they have to agree, okay? That's what the, that's what the equalizer part of this push-out diagram says. So what does this look like? And it turns out that's a degenerate octahedron, or, well, it's a degenerate lots of things. I'll just draw it out for you, and we can interpret it. I'm sorry that this is such a crappy picture, but we'll see. Okay, so um, what it looks like is this. Uh, so, it, so first of all, we have, first of all, these are sort of, these sort of, there's a hinge. Well, okay, we'll, we'll see. So it looks like, uh, um, so, uh, sorry. Let me just, let me draw this really big, so. Okay, so it looks sort of like this. So the idea is that there's a 90, so the idea is that there's a 90 degree angle here. I mean, we don't, there aren't angles here, but I just want to see like what the actual skeleton looks like. And there's something that looks like this. So the point is that this, this triangle is associated with this triangle, say, and this triangle is associated with this triangle. And then what we do is we uh, carve out, we carve out uh, out of 3D space this, this uh, sort of join of them. So, so it's sort of like a tent where on these two planes you erect a square. Does that make sense? And so what's the point of this? Well, the nice thing about viewing these things in terms of polyhedra is that you can see sort of which slices are squares, and squares mean independence. 
So what does this mean? This means that if you condition, uh, if you condition on one of these, if you condition on uh, like the, well, let's say you condition on necessarily there being a spark or necessarily there not being a spark or something in between, then the remaining, then the conditioning just means taking a slice for, at, oh yeah, and this line is this line, right? Then you get a square, meaning that, uh, meaning that if you condition, so here's the sort of generative network, if you condition on this, then these two are independent because they're a square. So that's one way that you can interpret this. Um, okay. Any questions? So, so, so I like. Why the arrows went that way? Because you were going to pull. Yeah. Well, I mean, the generative process wasn't really this way because if it, if it was this way, uh, the the thing is that, that if the generative process was the other way, uh, we would actually have to go from a tensor b to because a tensor b is sort of all the joint combinations, right? So. Um, another way to think about it is that we have a map just from the single expert to the scarf thing. Um, or you can think of it as sort of the reverse, from the scarf to the single expert. Um, that's a multi-valued function. Um, what's the point? The point is that since we are, have a map from like one of the coordinates to this, there's no, there, there's no uh, space for the data of the interaction. Right? For example, you can't say like expert XOR or expert equals scarf. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, great. Okay, oh no, so I'm running out of time, so, okay, so I've been, so some advice is that halfway through each talk, I should tell a joke, and, uh, well, we're way more than halfway through the talk, so it'll be a bad joke, and uh, so here's, the, uh, so first of all, any questions? After this, we'll do something completely different, we'll skip two and go to three. Okay, no questions. Okay, so the joke is this. Um, what do you call someone who reads a category three paper? A co-author. A co-author. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So uh, the last thing I want to do is instead of string diagrams, I want to talk to you about statistics. And uh, let's see. Uh, and I'll just I'll just erase this thing I just drew. Um, well, actually, let me just summarize two really really quickly. Uh, the idea is that you can define. Okay, let me just give you this inspirational diagram. So. So suppose that we have some distribution from a point. So we have a point to x, and then after that, what we can do is we always have a map from x to x tensor x, right? This is just the diagonal. And so, uh, at least in this category, we do so that we, we can split it. And so, so what Bayes' theorem says is that this object is the same thing as this object. Uh, is the same thing as this object. Okay, so what Bayesian just says in string diagram language is that you can slide this yx to become a yx to become a yx. It's very nice, and you can you know stack these to have like multiple conditions. You can prove things about like p of a given b comma c equals blah 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 just by moving these around. Is that a structure on your middle category? Okay. It's not a structure. Like we actually start start with this by definition. So we define uh, we define a box like this to be a conditional if it satisfies <coughs> this. So this is true by definition. And then the content of the theorem is that there exists such a thing always. Sometimes it's not unique, and that's the way of getting around normalization. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But but who cares about things being unique? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, so. Oh no. How many more minutes do I have, David? Um, ten. Oh, great. Oh, okay. Wait, I must be off by a lot. Okay, great. Ten more minutes. That's a lot. So statistics. So uh, what I'll do is I'll erase everything uh, so that we have space. Um, There's also the, the backboard if you want. Uh, those? No, no. Yeah. Oh, that. Uh, okay. These? Like these? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, I'll use these. So different subjects, no more geometry. Uh, let's talk about statistics. So the general framework is that we have some parameters that generate some, F, uh, so, some observations, okay? Now, what's a statistic? Well, a statistic is uh, just, uh, just a map from X to S, okay? Um, for convenience, uh, we don't want S to be bigger. For example, we don't, we don't want to embed S in anything big. We want, in fact, S to be a retract. 
okay? And this is, like, if you just think about intuitively what your statistics might be, like the average of your data or something, it's always a retract, okay? So what that looks like is that we have S, uh, wait, this is not right. Aha, there. Ta-da. Okay, does that make sense? So this is our definition of retract. For example, any, so, uh, any surjective uh, deterministic function, if this is a simplex and this is a simplex, we can make sense of what a deterministic function is, uh, namely a function that, um, well, okay, well, okay, there's a nice way of characterizing them, which is that they commute with this co-monoid operation, right? And there's a, in, or we can just say that in this very special case, they are the maps that are the image of the free functor from Z. Okay? Everything here is a convex set and everything's a convex map. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're still working this algebra, but of course we can have exotic convex things. So, so, but yeah. So that's something I'm going to work. Okay. So, so this is this is a statistic. This object is a statistic. Now there are some concepts. In particular, what does it mean to be an ancillary statistic? What does it mean to be sufficient, minimal sufficient, and complete? Okay. So I'll just uh, I'll just draw them out. So. Uh, what it means to be a sufficient statistic is that there exists an arrow here. So, okay. Intuitively, what this so that makes this commute, of course. That makes theta to x the same as theta to s to x. Intuitively, what this means is that uh, x is independent from theta given s because we have this Markov chain, right? Just like at the very beginning, function composition has to do with Markov chains. Okay, does that make sense? That's what it means to be sufficient. What does it mean to be minimal sufficient? Well, minimal sufficient is just initial among sufficients. Okay, so it's just, so this is again where the co limity stuff comes in, um, but, but implicitly. So, uh, wait, has everyone seen like sufficient statistics and minimal sufficient statistics? Yeah? No? Okay, well, take this as a definition. Um, I promise you they're important. Like, like in the, this stuff is actually mentioned in books, apparently. Okay, so um, what's, what's, what's another nice uh, concept? There's a concept of an ancillary statistic, which is sort of the opposite. So, x, um, t, um, so, So if we have a statistic like this, an ancillary statistic is one that depends only on the data, not on theta, right? Data, but not theta. So how do we say that? Well, we just say it factors the one, okay? So this is called an ancillary statistic. And finally, I'm not sure why I'm writing so big. Uh, finally, we have the concept of, well, oh, I, I know, Ta-da. Okay, finally we have the concept of a complete statistic. So we have uh, theta, uh, x, um, s, 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 so. A statistic is complete if there's a map of, oh, and so we always have this just by, just defined to be this composition, okay? So it's complete if uh, there exists this. Sir, is there a question? That, that, that triangle doesn't commute there? Uh, there's one of the triangles. No, uh, let, well, let's see. Because you said for that diagonal to exist means sufficient. Right. Uh, Definition of sufficient is that diagonal one there. Oh, oh, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, let me think. Mm. Complete implies sufficient. Uh, no, that's not true. Yeah, that, thank you. So that one just doesn't commute there. No? Um, what is, well, what is the, what is the case here? Um, yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess this isn't commute. Or how about, yeah, let's just consider complete sufficient statistics. And I figured this out before, and I worked it out, and it was right, but I forgot. But the problem is I worked out the theorem, not the definition, so. Uh, Can you just draw that arrow from theta down to the bottom s? Is that theta what down to the bottom s? Um, oh, he already has that. Yeah, I mean, well, but that's that's what that arrow was meant to be out right, of the complex. Here, let's oh, let's sorry. just write let's just write this. If we have if we have something like this, then if we call it complete, if uh, if uh, 
Oh well, let's just let's just let's just consider complete sufficient statistics, and I'll figure this out later. Okay, so uh, so uh, this is um, complete um, sufficient. Um, there do exist. There do exist uh, insufficient complete statistics and incomplete sufficient statistics, and this can be expressed in terms of arrows. There's just something I'm missing. Maybe it's what Brendan said. But this is enough for the three theorems that, well, let's say two theorems that we'll talk about. Um, so does this make sense? So we have sufficiency, minimal sufficiency, ancillariness, and completeness. Okay. What's so, the definition of morphism of, I miss your definition of morphism of sufficient statistics? Um, it's just a, it's just a map a, that commutes with this whole okay. triangle. Okay. Um, and the theta, and the mm -hmm. theta to x now. Okay, so we have theorem, uh, let's see, uh, complete sufficients are independent from ancillaries. So this is a this is a theorem that's actually used in real life. But actually, we're used we're we're all in the finite case, but you can probably extend this to the infinite case where you're working with measures instead of finite support distributions. And if so, then this theorem just says, for example, that uh, the sample mean and sample variance of a normal distribution are independent. And this is non-trivial to prove, and this is the way that people use it to prove that. And so this is Basu's theorem. And what I what I've done is I've translated these words, which are usually said in terms of measures and stuff, and not really in terms of looking at the maps, just looking at the objects, into this thing, uh, in, into this language, so that it's easy to prove. But I think that these are sort of the, if one generalizes probably to just like a, a string diagram theory, then I think this is the right set of notions. But okay, so how do we prove this? You're, well, you have two minutes. Probably. Two minutes, okay. Well, we'll just prove Basu's theorem, but not the other theorem then. Okay, so uh, let's just write out what we have. Um, so uh, sufficient, uh, so let's see, uh, what do we have? So we have uh, this, we have this, we have this, we have uh, this. Okay, so, wait, this doesn't look right. Oh, yeah, we actually, let me not draw all the arrows. I'll, let me just draw the arrows that we want. So, okay. And, okay. So um, what, does, what does completeness mean? Well, completeness means that this triangle commutes, right? So it means that this triangle commutes. What does uh, sufficiency say? It means that this triangle commutes. Oh, right, yeah, uh, of course, yeah. Sufficiency just means that this triangle commutes. So completeness just, mm -hmm. yeah, you're right, Brendan. Completeness just means that this triangle commutes. None of this is the other triangle. OK, yeah. So completeness uh, or sufficiency, yeah means that this triangle commutes. And what does ancillariness mean? It just means that this triangle commutes. Okay. Therefore, we have a map. We have a map that goes from S to 1 <coughs> to T, which is the same, uh, which commutes with S to X to T. And so what we have is that, and remember, T is generated from X. So we have S, uh, uh, x, uh, 1, t. The fact that going from s to t is the same as factoring through 1 means that s is independent from t. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so that proves the theorem. And there are other things you can do, like uh, let me just mention the statement, and you can also work it out with diagrams. You can show that every, if, there, if a minimal sufficient exists, then every complete sufficient is equal to that minimal sufficient. And this is called Bahadur's theorem. And uh, the thing that you need is that uh, if you have a retract and then the arrow given by minimality, then that's another minimal error. So yeah, thank you. Question? Yeah. Uh, where did all this come from? Oh. Um, my head, but uh, yeah, I mean, I talked to David and Brendan after their class, mm -hmm. after on category theory, so. And told us this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>